Okay, hello everybody, I'm Richard Southwell, and I'd like to talk about some Spectrum Mobility games. So, this is a project which I worked on with Zhang Wai Huang, and we're in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, and we also worked with Xin Liao, who's at UC Davis in the Computer Science Department. So, let me give you some background behind this project. Basically, it's all about spectrum allocation. And so, um, the idea is that wireless devices need spectrum to work. They need to use certain amounts of spectrum to do communication and things like that. Um, but this is becoming more and more problematic because the number of wireless devices is increasing exponentially at the moment. Uh, but there's only a finite amount of spectrum, and so what's happening is that the spectrum is becoming increasingly congested, and it's a difficult problem to work out how the available spectrum should be shared amongst the wireless devices that need to use it. In fact, the situation is even is uh, quite strange, because... Um, the basically there are licensed parts of the spectrum which are owned by somebody by some corporation or something and uh, there are also unlicensed parts of the spectrum which can be used by anybody now the unlicensed parts of the spectrum are becoming increasingly congested uh, because they're what are used by lots and lots of users um, but the licensed part of the spectrum is not really used to its full capacity. Um, things like uh, channels owned by TV broadcasting companies are not used to their full capacity. And so we've got this kind of odd situation where some of these licensed channels are underutilized and most of the unlicensed spectrum is heavily overutilized. And so for this reason, people have come up with a new technology uh, which is cognitive radio. Uh, and cognitive radio gives users the ability to opportunistically, ac opportunistically access these licensed channels. Um, and so in recent years, there's been, a lot of, there's been a lot of work trying to understand what's going to happen when users have the ability to change channels and sense channels. And basically, cognitive radio technology gives wireless users more flexibility. It allows them to use channels while the license holders are away and then you know maybe the license holders come back online and the unlicensed users have to get out of their way because after all uh, those guys own the licenses to transmit on their channels. Um, so they allow this kind of um, this kind of dynamical behavior and they open up a lot of new questions about how wireless users can self-organize and share the spectrum. Um, however, quite recently, the FCC uh, have ruled that, um, in fact, they are going to make it so that unlicensed users can access some of this licensed spectrum. But... They've done it in a way which wasn't anticipated by some of the cognitive radio research community because they've, um, they've said, yes, um, licensed bands can be used, but they have a proviso. And that proviso is that there should be a database which tells people when um, there's going to be TV white space available. OK, so let me just explain a little bit more about this. This is regarding um, this is re regarding TV broadcasting channels, um, and basically the FCC have now said that these things can be used by unlicensed users um, when they're not being used by the TV broadcasting companies. So there are these times and uh, when we have this white space, and um, the FCC have said yes, it can be used. So that's a good thing, because that means that um, more spectrum has been opened up for the use of the general public. Uh, but they have this proviso here, that there should be a database which describes when 
TV white space will be available. So what this means here is that the spectrum allocation problem is a little bit different. So something, some of the things that some of the um, cognitive radio researchers were anticipating. I mean, basically we're looking at a scenario here where we are having to think about this problem of dynamic spectrum allocation, but we actually have some idea about what's going to happen in the future. Um, and there are other systems like this as well. For example, radar bands. You see, radars go around and around. And so, you know, radars do use up some of the spectrum. But when radars, the uh, times and spectra which radars will leave available are predictable. Uh, so this is another scenario where we have these spectrum opportunities uh, which are forming a kind of predictable uh, pattern. And so both of these problems open up an interesting kind of question, which is that if you know that particular spectra are going to be available at particular times, then what are you going to do about it? Um, in particular, if you're a wireless user, you want to use a piece of spectrum for yourself, but you know that other wireless users are thinking similarly. And so you have to plan which channels you're going to use when. And this is what uh, we have been studying. We've been studying these, what's, what I call, what we call spectrum mobility games, which is where you decide um, how you're going to change the, um, the channels which you're using over time to try and get as good quality of service as possible. Um, so this is the scenario we're interested in. If the users have full knowledge of a spectrum availability, then how should they plan to change channels? Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about how to model spectrum mobility now. So basically, it's, it's useful to think about a kind of two-dimensional space. One dimension would be time, and another dimension would be the, the spectrum, the different channels. Okay, And so uh, spectrum mobility basically means changing channels. Okay, And the idea is that um, the way a wireless user changes channels over time can really be thought of as a kind of route through space-time, or if you like, a kind of directed path through a two-dimensional grid like this. So, for example, here we've got this scenario where, you know, the, the user is on this channel for the first time step, then they switch to this channel and stay on it for two time steps, etc. Um, and so we can think about this because the point is that um, if the users have some kind of prior knowledge about which channels will be available and which channels won't, then they'll know enough information to make a spectrum mobility plan. Um, this might not be so relevant for the TV white space networks, as I shall discuss later, but it is relevant for things like radar networks. And I expect that understanding how to plan spectrum mobility is going to become a more and more relevant issue in the future. I'll talk more about the motivations later, but I just want to explain this picture. So we're going to use grey shaded blocks to represent um, spectrum time blocks which don't provide a very good quality of service, either because they are being used by license holders and therefore are inaccessible, or because they're highly congested for some other reason. Okay, So they are not very good um, things. But we also have this white space here which is available. Um, and so the idea is that the user wishes to choose a plan about how to switch channels so that they uh, pick up as much of this white space as possible. Okay, And this is the basic idea behind the system. And the basic question is, how do you make a spectrum mobility plan that benefits you? And this is actually a remarkably difficult question to answer uh, because there are a few complications one of the key complications in these systems is congestion, okay? The fact of the matter is, if multiple users are accessing the same channel at the same time, then they're going to cause each other congestion. That's going to lower their quality of service, so that's, that's not good. 
So um, just as these users are trying to make their spectrum mobility plans so that they sort of pick up as much white space as possible, there's also another effect which makes the users want to avoid picking the same paths through, through um, frequency time as each other. And there are other complications as well, like what happens if it takes a long time to switch channels? Um, for example, um, and this is a realistic consideration, in real wireless devices, um, a system cannot switch channels instantly. It takes a certain amount of time, and during that switching time, there is some um, there's uh, there's some loss really because there's a time when the system is not transmitting. Um, and so, if it takes a certain amount of time to switch channels, then the the problem is already seeming quite complicated. I mean, how can you pick up as many of these white blocks as possible? when it takes time to switch from one of these channels to another one. That's already a fairly interesting problem. And there are other issues as well. I mean, as I've said, if there are multiple users, these users are going to diminish one another's quality of service when they use the same spectrum time block. And so that's another consideration. Okay, so I think in a way the problem is sort of analogous to the problem of paparazzi photographers. Um, if you think about these different celebrities in, in Hollywood or something, people have a rough idea about where the celebrities are going to be at given times. And so the photographers uh, are going to form plans about where they're going to go to photograph this or that celebrity. But there's also, and so there's a few issues. I mean, it does take the these photographers time to travel from Hollywood Boulevard to Britney Spears mansion or whatever they do and um, during that time obviously then they're missing chances to take photographs and there's also a kind of congestion element to this paparazzi story because if you've got loads and loads of photographers snapping a particular celebrity they're going to change that celebrity's behavior and they're probably going to get worse uh, photos like the celebrity wearing sunglasses uh, covering their face and running out a door or something. Um, and so, you know, there are some similarities between these two scenarios. Also, one can think about things like taxi drivers. It's all pretty similar stuff. Anyway, so to model this kind of scenario, we propose the spectrum mobility game. And this is a very general game theoretic model about how users are going to plan their route routes through frequency time. Um, so we're, we assume that the users have prior knowledge of which channels are going to be available when, and they have to use this knowledge to plan their to make their spectrum mobility plans. What's a spectrum mobility plan? It's basically a route through through frequency time. It's a way of changing channels at different times. Okay, so here are the different ingredients of the game. Uh, we suppose that switching channels takes a certain amount of time. We call that S. And we also assume that there's a certain cost to switching channels. We'll call that K. So that could reflect the power consumption or the risk of transmission failure due to switching channels. Um, we want to make our system general, so we'll assume that switching channels cost K. And this is the important bit. We're going to assume that um, when a user uses a channel C at a time T, they get a payoff like this, F, C, T of X. Okay. So here, F, C, T is some non-increasing, non-negative function. Okay. And... Um, X here is just the total number of players who are also using channel C at time T. So what we're saying here is that in some very kind of general way described by this function F C of T, um, we have the, the amount of benefit that a user derives from using channel C at time T decreases somehow with the um, amount of congestion X of that 
frequency time block. So we're making things really very general. We're going to allow, I suppose that we can associate different frequency time blocks with different sorts of payoff functions. And, um, you know, uh, we're really making things very general. So a channel can provide different qualities of service at different times. And different channels can provide different qualities of service. So as I've already said, uh, we have these players then. And their strategies are spectrum mobility plans. Their strategies are routes, free frequency time. And then the total payoff a player gets is just the sum of the payoffs they get from all the frequency time blocks that they visit, minus the amount that they have to pay for switching the channels. Okay? So here's a sort of explicit example of one of these systems. Well, suppose that the switching cost is equal, equal to the switching time, is equal to one. And here we've just got two channels. And we're going to assume that our players have information about when these channels are going to be available over the next four time slots. Okay. In particular, these players know what the payoff functions are going to be associated with these the different frequency time blocks. So channel one here, this has a constant payoff function of 4 divided by x. So, for example, if there are 7 uses of channel 1 at time step 3, or time slot 3, then the payoff each of those uses gets is going to be 4 divided by 7. Okay? Um, so, channel 1 here is a fairly reliable thing, which always provides the same quality of service, um, disregarding congestion. Whereas channel 2 is a bit different. It provides a pretty good quality of service of 10 divided by x on the first time step. But then suddenly it goes off, perhaps because the license holder comes online. And it's a good idea to vacate this channel then and make use of one of the other channels. So basically in this game, the strategies of the players are spectrum mobility plans. In other words, they are routes through frequency time. But these routes have to respect the fact, uh, have to respect the switching cost, you see. So basically, you can think of these as sort of um, paths, which always travel towards the right. But when one of these paths changes tracks, when the user changes channels, it takes them a certain amount of time to do that, equal to k here. And uh, that's time within which the user cannot transmit, and therefore cannot achieve benefit from using their particular channel. So in this case here, assuming there's just one player in this system, the player gets a payoff of 10 divided by 1 uh, during this first time step while they're using channel 2. And then they get a payoff of minus 1 here because they switch channels. And then they get a payoff of 4. And so this is a, And they don't gain any payoff here. Um, they just pay a cost of 1, sorry. And then they get a payoff of... 4 divided by 1 on time slot 3, and 4 divided by 1 on time slot 4. So their total payoff is 17. In fact, you can show that this is the very um, best payoff that this user can get in this scenario. Now if we suppose that there's another player in the system, um, the other player might pick a, um, a route through frequency time like this, something nice and simple. And now in this two-player system, uh, things are a little more complicated. So the uh, the payoff of player 1 is now different. They get the same payoff on the first time slot, 10 divided by 1. They still pay 1 for their switch, and then they land on channel 1 at the beginning of the third time slot. But now there is also another user on this channel. So now, at, now x is equal to 2. And so on the third time slot, player 1 gets a payoff of 4 divided by 2, and similarly on the fourth time slot. So now this player gets a payoff of 13. What I'm trying to do here is illustrate um, all these different effects, you know, switching time, switching cost, and payoffs, which are influencing how these players are choosing their spectrum mobility plans. Well, you can actually check here that this is actually what they call a Nash equilibrium. So if these are the only two players in this system, then one can show that 
neither player has any incentive to alter their spectrum mobility plan from what is shown here. So basically, uh, one of the key insights is that these spectrum mobility plans can be represented as routes through a graph structure. So the idea is basically that for each of the, we represent each of these spectrum mobility blocks as a vertex, and we use directed edges to represent the different kinds of actions that a user can take um, in the middle of uh, executing their spectrum mobility plans. So there's really two different kinds of actions that they can do. They can basically either stay on the same channel or switch channels. Uh, staying on the same channel corresponds to traversing one of these horizontal edges, and traversing channels corresponds to traversing one of these diagonal edges here. And these are a bit longer to represent how time is lost when one switches channels. So basically now, our system is something quite concrete because the spectrum mobility plans are basically just paths through this kind of graph structure. Um, and, you know, we can associate, as I say, the different vertices represent different frequency time blocks. And so we can associate those with pairs. So a vertex CT represents channel C at time T. And um, these different vertices are now associated with these different payoff functions of these different blocks. Um, and also these directed edges are associated with costs. Okay, So players now gain payoffs at the vertices, but they also pay costs for traversing these edges. Right, so this is the basic idea, and we, um, by taking, by making it graphical in this way, we can make the system very kind of rigorous. And so now, basically, um, in a kind of obvious way, these routes, which were originally through this kind of grid structure, can be cor correspond to routes through this kind of network structure. And players pick up payoffs at the vertices, and they have to pay costs for traversing the edges. And basically, this gives us a nice concrete framework for setting up this spectrum mobility game because now we can we imagine that all the users say we have n users we imagine that each of them have knowledge of this kind of network which describes the spectrum availability of the coming t time steps and so uh, what they then have to do is to make spectrum mobility plans as in they have to pick routes from the left hand side of this network to the right hand side of this network and if these players are rational, they want to do it in a way that maximizes their payoff. And so um, they've got to think about things like how much congestion they may incur from, use, uh, uh, from using the same vertex as other players. And also thinking about how much cost they might have to pay by switching across these diagonal edges. And it's a multiplayer game. And this is, as I say, a pure Nash equilibrium of the game, because the red player and the blue player have no incentive to change the routes which they have chosen. So this is a formal kind of definition of the game now. Um, so the users know about, they have the data about the C channels over the next T time steps. This can be in the form of a database, or it could be in the form of simply being able to predict what the spectrum availability is going to be, as is the case in radar networks. I must say that uh, I originally motivated this uh, by talking about the FCC and TV white space, but these kind of games aren't really very relevant there because um, the kind of time scales involved in TV white space are very, very long. And so um, the sort of things that make spectrum mobility complicated is the dynamical aspects. When things are changing quickly, it becomes an interesting kind of scenario. Uh, when things are changing very slowly, all that happens is the users optimize themselves across the channel as if it was going to be static. And then, you know, maybe half an hour later, one thing changes. And it's very easy for the users to adapt to that. Uh, but there are other kinds of spectra which vary much more dynamically 
And it seems to make sense that similar kind of rulings are going to occur in the future. And it's going to be important to understand how users can change their spectrum mobility plans in a very dynamic kind of spectra environment. Anyway, that's all a bit of a tangent. I want to talk about the definitions of these models now. So I'll just give you the formal definitions. We have this graph. Its vertex set is a Cartesian product of the set of integers from 1 to C that represents the channels and the integers from 1 to T that represents the different time slots. And so um, each vertex is essentially a pair, C, T, where C represents a channel and T represents a time slot. And each of these vertices, each of, essentially each of these um, frequency time blocks is associated with a payoff function, F, C, T. That's some generic non-increasing function. So we've got this we've got this graph and each vertex is associated with some payoff function. And we've also got some edges, okay? So there's actually two different kinds of edges. Horizontal edges of the form C T linked to C T plus one, they correspond to just staying on the same channel, staying on channel C at time T. Um, and then there's also these kind of diagonal edges, C T um, linked to C T plus S plus 1. This corresponds to switching channels. Sorry, this should be a C dash here. So this is the edge C T linked to C dash T plus S plus 1. So this is a kind of diagonal edge which corresponds to switching from channel C to channel C dash at time T. This should be a C dash. Uh, and that takes an amount of time S because S is equal to the switching time in this system. And um, the thing is that each of these horizontal edges has a cost zero associated with it, but traversing one of these diagonal edges costs K. K is the switching cost. So traversing one of the edges which corresponds to switching means you have to pay the switching cost, right? That makes sense. Okay, so... A spectrum mobility plan, then, that's where a user just decides um, how they're going to switch channels um, over the next t time steps. So essentially what they're doing is they're picking a route through, through frequency time, uh, a route from a vertex of the form C, 1 to a vertex of the form C dash, T, where C and C dash can be any channels. And um, the total payoff that they get then is, um, is given by this expression here. This is the sum of the payoffs that the player gets uh, for the vertices that they visit minus the cost that they pay for traversing these diagonal edges. In other words, the last bit here is the cost they pay due to switching. Um, and so the, the payoff which the player derives from using a particular vertex V is just equal to f of v, the payoff function associated with that vertex, of the total number of users who have selected spectrum mobility plans which pass through that vertex. Okay? So, this is the basic idea behind the game. Um, basically, these players are just picking routes through frequency time, trying to maximize their payoffs. And we're really casting this in a graph theoretic way. Okay, so in order to understand spectrum mobility games better, um, it turns out that we can relate them quite well to these things which are called network congestion games. So the idea of a network congestion game, uh, or more precisely a symmetric network congestion game, is that you have some kind of network or directed graph, if you like, and the edges are associated with non-decreasing, non-negative cost functions, not payoff functions, cost functions, okay? And um, the idea is that there, there's a source, alpha, and there's a sink, or destination, omega, and each of the players uh, picks a route from the source to the destination, and then the total cost that that player incurs is equal to the costs that they, the sum of the costs that they pay, for traversing each of the edges, 
And just like in a traffic network or something, the cost that a um, user must incurs for selecting a particular edge is um, just equal to the cost function of the total number of users of that edge. Okay? Well, these kind of systems have a lot of nice properties. They've been very well studied. Um, so in this scenario, for example, just say we have two players for simplicity. Um, player one here, they just take this fairly direct path from the source to the destination. Uh, whereas player two here takes this more convoluted path here. So the payoff here, sorry, the cost here that player one incurs, well, this first edge that they traverse has a cost function of x squared associated with it. So the player incurs a cost of one squared for using that edge. And then they incur a cost of one plus two for using this second edge. Because this second edge has a cost function of one plus x associated with it. But there are two players who select this edge. So x is two here. So the total cost that this player incurs here is four. OK, so that's the basic idea of the symmetric network congestion games. And they have some very nice properties. They always have pure Nash equilibria. And they have this very good property, which is that if the players do better response updating, in other words, if the players improve their choices one at a time asynchronously, then the population will always eventually organize themselves into a pure Nash equilibrium. So symmetric network congestion games have this really nice property that the players can themselves sort themselves out into a um, mutually acceptable way to share these different routes. Now here's the point of our research on this project. Every spectrum mobility game is symmetric to some symmetric, uh, is, sorry, is equivalent to some symmetric network congestion game. What this means is that our systems have all the same nice properties as the symmetric network congestion games, because basically the spectrum mobility games are essentially just special kinds of symmetric network congestion games. So this is very good. Um, here's a very cartoonish description of the proof to that theorem. Basically, we take our spectrum mobility game which has this kind of graph theoretic flavor, as I've already described. And then we can convert it into a symmetric network congestion game. There's two stages in the conversion. Firstly, we change the thing from a payoff maximization kind of system to a sort of cost minimization kind of system by introducing this idea of regret. We say that the regret that a player incurs from using a particular vertex at a particular time is equal to the maximum possible payoff that the player could get on a given time step, take away the, uh, the payoff that they actually get for using that vertex at that time step. So this is just, this doesn't really change the way that people play the game. It's, it's almost cosmetic, really. Um, so we convert the thing into a regret minimization game, and then we can just add some, a kind of virtual source and a virtual destination onto the game and change these vertices into directed edges uh, without really affecting the fundamental topology or what's going on. And we've effectively converted this into a symmetric network congestion game. And so this, um, this conversion shows that the uh, spectrum mobility game has all the nice properties that the symmetric network congestion game has. And that's, um, that's good. And so, uh, in particular, this means that we have a polynomial time algorithm for finding pure Nash equilibria. And we really have a way that these wireless users can organize themselves over the spectrum. Uh, in particular, um, if the players just do best response updates one after another, then they will reach a pure Nash equilibrium. Um, and that's a good thing. And also... Um, uh, so the, the best responses can be computed in polynomial time here. So to compute the best response, if you know everyone else's spectrum mobility plans, basically 
it, that turns out to be equivalent to solving a kind of shortest path problem. So it's easy to compute best responses. And so, and then you can just keep doing this best response updating um, until a pure Nash equilibrium is reached. And so one can imagine a particular protocol by which this could be achieved, you know. These wireless users have the information about which channels are going to be available when. And then they can kind of discuss with each other about what kind of spectrum mobility plans they intend to implement. And they can modify them uh, according to this kind of best response updating algorithm. And that's always going to reach a pure Nash equilibrium, which is a good thing. Um, so there's also some other polynomial time algorithms to compute Nash equilibria in special cases. There's details about that in the paper. Basically, it corresponds to certain special results about symmetric network congestion games with integer valued cost functions. Okay, so that's a little bit about the work. It's still very much in its early stages. And in the future, we want to introduce a spatial aspect into the sort of congestion mechanics behind these games. Because in real wireless networks, there's this thing called spectrum reuse, where uh, if two wireless users are on the same channel, but distantly spaced, then in fact, they're not going to cause congestion to each other. And there's also a fair amount of work to be done in understanding the structure of the Nash equilibria of these systems.